sermon text this morning will come from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting, for that is the end of mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of faith the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as cackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of the thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not wisdom for you to ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see under the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he had made crooked? This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I would ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we work through what is admittedly, at times, a head-scratching book, we need to remind ourselves of a very basic fact about the book of Ecclesiastes, and that is that it is a book of wisdom. Wisdom books in the Bible are given to teach us about how to think about and how to live life when things are complicated, when there do not, does not seem to be any clear-cut answers, any clear right or wrong. And wisdom literature in the Bible comes at a very unique time in God's history of redemption when Israel had been given a new stage, a new part of her national life. God had recently given Israel a temple and a king, and then also along with those two things, we see the writing and the development of the wisdom literature. Books like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. Kings need to be trained by God's law. They need to be trained by all the law that we found find in the Pentateuch. But also, <coughs> kings need God's wisdom for all the situations of life, for all the situations that come with governing that are simply not addressed in God's law. What is a king to do when two prostitutes come before him, each claiming that the child they bring before is their own? Leviticus does not give us an answer, but Solomon, being trained by God's word, improvises on the spot, improvises an answer that is wise, that brings clarity, that brings justice, and that brings glory to God. Wisdom is about wrestling with all the complicated issues of life. But if we are, if we are uh, honest with ourselves, we can all admit that we are much more comfortable in making absolute judgments about right or wrong. We're much more uh, uh, comfortable with the parts of the Bible that say, don't do this. It's very easy to understand. Rather than wrestling with the tension that we find in a book like Ecclesiastes. But even in the book of Proverbs, we see the tension that exists within God's wisdom. If you are in a, a Bible reading habit, I think we have all experienced frustration with Proverbs 26, 4, and 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Well, Solomon, which is it? Are we to answer a fool according to his own foolishness, 
or not? Is it yes or is it no? I imagine he might smile at us, shrug, and say, maybe. It depends. Well, how do I know? How do I know which one to do in a particular situation? And he would tell us, you need wisdom. And one of the ways in which we grow in wisdom, in which we obtain wisdom, is simply by wrestling with all of God's word, particularly the wisdom book, particularly a book in the New Testament like James, or the Sermon on the Mount, which is the New Testament wisdom. But we not just need to wrestle with the pages that are before us, but we need to wrestle with the pages that are before us as we live out our lives. As we go about our lives, day to day, moment to moment, wrestling with how God's word applies, wrestling with the complexities of life, seeking to grow in wisdom, seeking to mature and grow in a world that is, we can admit, oftentimes complex. And one of the things that you'll notice if you have your Bibles open to Ecclesiastes 7 and just glance your eye over the page is that there is a change in Solomon's style in, in, in the verses that we have read today. So far in the book, what he has offered us is, is some reflections and some arguments about what he can conclude when he looks at the world around us. But for the first time in the book of Ecclesiastes, he is giving us the form of traditional wisdom, and that is he is giving us Proverbs. He is giving us, this is a series of Proverbs. And if you were attentive when these were read, or if you glance down your eye on the page again, you can see that there is one word in which we see repeated. And that is the word better. Right? Better. Solomon, at the end of chapter 6, which we covered last week, asked the question, he says, Who even knows what is good for a man while he lives the few days of his vain or vaporous life? Who even knows what is good for a man? But in chapter 7, he begins to answer us in terms of, well, some things are better than other things. Right? So he is beginning to answer that question that he asked at the end of chapter 6. Some things are better than other things. And if we are seeking to obtain wisdom, if we are seeking to grow in maturity, what we need to learn to do, one of the things we need to learn to do, is learn how to make judgments like Solomon is making here. To recognize the things in our, in our life, the directions we can take, the situations that we find ourselves, and decide what is better. What is better for us to pursue if our end result is wisdom and maturity? And I have titled this sermon, The Contrary Path of Wisdom, because the path to a better life that Solomon lays out here is contrary to what we want to hear. Death is better than birth. Rebuke is better than praise. The end of a thing is better than the beginning. <coughs> we might see the wisdom in what Solomon is saying, but these are not easy things for us to hear. And note too that these verses, as I have said, come right after the question that Sol Solomon asked at the end of chapter 6, who knows what is good for a man? And then look down at verse 11. 11 Solomon in verse 11 said, wisdom is the thing that is good. And I think this helps us put all the Proverbs in context. I think considering how it's sandwiched between the question and the answer, we need to understand that this entire proverb is how are we to find wisdom? And so what are these things better for us? They are better to help us chase after, to help us find wisdom and maturity. These things are better because these things will bring us wisdom more than others. And so when we begin looking at verse 1, we might see, we might believe that the Proverbs are a little free-floating free and disconnected. But I think there are basically three themes that come up in verses 1 through 10. In our pursuit of wisdom, death is a better teacher than birth. In our pursuit of wisdom, rebuke is better than a false praise. In our pursuit of wisdom, Patient hope is better than frustration. 
And so Solomon begins in verse 1, and he says that a good name is better than a precious ointment. And a precious ointment is an expensive, luxurious item. I don't know if we even have things like this in existence anymore. But think about the uh, jar of anointment, the jar of spices that Mary broke open and anointed over Jesus before the week of his crucifixion. If you remember what Judah said, Judah says that could be sold for 300 denarii. That is, that thing could be sold for the entire year's wages of a regular person. Right, so we're talking about this precious ointment being worth a whole lot of money. And Solomon is saying, but what is more precious, what is worth more is your name, your good reputation. And we all know stories about men or women that give up their reputation in pursuit of wealth. They grow wealthy, but they became known as trust, untrustworthy. They become wealthy, but they became known as someone who is unfaithful. They become wealthy, but they became known as a cutthroat. Solomon is telling that your name is worth a whole lot more than wealth. He tells us the same thing in Proverbs 22. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And this may seem out of place with the rest of the proverb as we look down, especially as he moves immediately into talking about death. It is sort of jarring for us to read, but I, I think we can understand the rest of the proverb as teaching us how to attain a good name. Right? And so obtaining a good name is, is part of pursuing wisdom. And a man with a good name is a man who lives in light of the reality of his death. A, good, a man with a good reputation can receive rebuke well. And a man with a good reputation is a man of patient hope. Solomon goes on to say, jarringly, as I said, the day of death is better than the day of birth. But Solomon here has not become the cynic. He is not arguing that death is preferable to life. But I think what he is implying here is made more clear in the next verse. It is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. To put this into jargon, it is better to go to a funeral than to go to a party. And of course, this is contrary to what we want to hear. We'd rather go someplace where we can let loose, where we can laugh, where we can have a good time and hang out with friends. But he is telling us that it's better to go to a funeral. Why? Because there is much more wisdom available to you, much more things that we need to learn at a funeral than at a party. At funerals, he tells us, we come face to face in an undeniable way with what is the end of all mankind, but more importantly, what is our own end? And he tells us that those living, when they go to the house of mourning, when they go to a funeral par parlor, need to lay it all up to heart. That is, we need to consider it. We need to ponder it. We need to let the reality of this end sink in. Do not ignore it. Do not go on acting as if somehow we will escape it. Do not put off with dealing with the implication. You will die and the day to start facing and dealing with that fact is right now. Living wisely is living according to the fact that one day you will die. And so do the things matter to you now are they going to be the same thing that will matter to you on your deathbed? Throughout all of Christian history, there has been a phrase that the church has used to remind the people of this fact, and that is the phrase, memento mori, remember you will die. And remembering and facing this fact often will cause us to live wisely. In fact, the novelist John Steinbeck, who was no Christian, understood this fact and wrote that it seems to me if you or I must choose between two courses of thought or action, what we should do is remember our dying and try to live in a way that our death brings no pleasure to the world. 
Right? So even a, a unbeliever like uh, John Steinbeck here can say, hey, living in light of your death so that people bring, that your death bring only sorrow to those, that, that it bring no pleasure to the world, that is simply a wise way for a person to live. And so one of the ways that the day of death is better than the day of birth is because as we move towards it, we begin to take stock of the things that really and ultimately matter in our lives and live accordingly. One of the reasons we uh, consider uh, youth in a broad category foolishness is because so often youth can simply put the fact that they are going to die out of their mind. Right, the younger we are, the more invincible we feel, the more death is not a reality that ever crosses our thought, and so we go and do stupid things. We go and do foolish things, but as we mature physically, as we move towards our death, that reality should cause us to reflect on the things that truly and really matter and should be the thing to stir us onto wisdom and maturity. Solomon says that sorrow is better than laughter. And he's not saying that we should be sad all the time, but his point is that the sorrow that comes with facing the hard facts of life, with looking at the world as it is, and recognizing it, and dealing with it, and letting it affect you, can lead to wisdom, and wisdom can lead us to a better and deeper-seated joy. Right? So he said, by the sadness of faith, the heart is made glad. And that's been his argument for the whole thing, that true joy in this life comes not from simply ignoring all the hard facts of life, but looking at it, looking into the vapor, looking into the fact that we control nothing, but God is the one who is in control. He is the author of all things. And so we can step forward into our life with faith, with hope, and with joy. And so the wise person appreciates you don't have to appreciate the hardness of a difficult situation, but you should be able to appreciate what it can bring to you, how it can mature you. The wise person does not seek to avoid hard situations, does not seek to avoid sad situations. When, when hard things come, the wise man does not seek distracting pleasures. When crisis comes, the heart of the wise man is found in the house of mourning. But the fool is the one who disengages. The fool is the one who distracts himself in what Solomon calls the house of mirth. He simply refuses to deal with the hardships that are coming with him, and he goes off and he escapes in whatever various ways men and women can escape. And so how often do we consider our death? How often do we let that reality sink in? How often do we live our lives knowing that someday they will come to an end? And we live in a society in which we distract ourselves from this fact in all sorts of ways. We find that we no longer have funerals in which we mourn, but we have celebrations of life in which we put on our smiles and say, well, they're in a better place, and so there's no reason to be sad, except the fact that we have lost a person that mattered to us. Except the fact that death is still the enemy. Yes, it is overcome in and through Jesus Christ, but it is still enemy. It is still a hard fact of life, and we should face it and not turn away from it. In our culture, we celebrate and value youth, and we seek to hold on to it in any way in which we can. Through a midlife crisis, through pursuing uh, anti-aging uh, people or products, and all these things simply lead to and, and conforms us into our own immaturity. And so let us learn to say with Moses in Psalm 90, Lord, teach us to number our days so that we can get a heart of wisdom. Solomon's second point is that we learn wisdom by listening to rebuke rather than to the praise of fools. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of the fool. And of course, this is contrary to what we want to hear. We really want to hear someone singing my praise. We want to hear people tell us how great we are, how good we are doing in our pursuit, how intelligent, how skilled, how funny we are. 
But what do we ultimately gain from this, especially if it's coming from a foolish person? We do not learn our blind spots. Therefore, we make no corrections in our life, but simply we are puffed up in our pride. We are determined that we are on the right course and we need no change in direction. We need to make no changes because why would I make any changes if I am as great as this person has told me I am? And so it's better to listen to a wise man rebuke you. It's better to have a wise person call out your faults, to bring illumination to your blind spots in which you do not see or understand, to point out the correction that you need to make in your life. And of course, this is much harder to hear and take, but it is better for you if your goal is wisdom and maturity rather than ease and comfort. Solomon says that the laughter of fools is like thorns under a pot. Imagine trying to start a fire, but all you have is some bramble bushes, right? It begins to snap and crackle and make a lot of noise, but there will be very little heat produced by such a fire. And so he says the laughter, the song, the words of a fool is very noisy. It might be very entertaining to watch them spit out and crackle, but he says it offers no real value to you in your life. And again, we should understand, not misunderstand Solomon here. He is not in love with pain, with sorrow, with hardship, with rebuke, with just, he's not uh, just in love with pain for its own sake, but because of what all these things bring to us and lead us to. Just like we heard in Hebrews 12 today, for the moment, all, dif all discipline, all rebuke, seems painful rather than pleasant, yet it later yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Right, rebuke and discipline is not ever fun when you're going through it, but if you go through it well, if you go through it pain uh, uh, faithfully, it later will bring you great fruit of wisdom and maturity and righteousness. And our problem is that we are often too impatient in our trials to reach this end result of righteousness, to reach the end result of joy. The thing we saw throughout our entire book of James is that when hardships and trials and difficulties come, we want out in whatever way we can find to get out of the situation. Whatever easy way out. And so Solomon warns us that oppression or it could also be affliction or trials, can drive even the wise man to pursue madness. Our oppression, our affliction, our trials can drive even someone who is relatively wise and mature to act like a fool, to long for the ease of the word, the laughter, and the song of the fool, rather than continuing to pursue the path of wisdom through oppression and affliction. The third point in our pursuit of wisdom is that patient hope is better than frustration. Verses 8 through 10. Better is the end of the beginning. Better is the patient spirit than the proud spirit. Do not be quick to anger, for anger lodges right within the heart and the soul of the fool. Do not ask why were past times so much better than they are now. It is not from wisdom to ask questions like this. And so one of the ways in which we can refuse to learn wisdom is by refusing to accept that all of our problems are inherent in life under the, under the sun. All of our problems are due because God has put the burden of the curse on the world, because God is the one who has taken our, the good and perfect world he created, and as a result of sin, he has bent it. We are often think, that our problems are because we live in this day and age. And make no mistake, we live in dark and evil time. Rebellion is rampant in all areas of, of life and in society. But one, and this is something we need to pay attention to, one of the foolish mistakes that conservative people make is to desire a return to some imagined golden age of the past. Whatever time we desire to put on a pedestal, 
If we actually went back, what we would find is that, hey, the world would bent out of shape and crooked there as well. If we were to go back, we would find a world that is under the burden of a curse, just like our world now. What we would find if we went back is that people are sinful just like they are now. That people were oppressed just like they are now. That foolishness runs rampant just like it does now because the problem is human nature, not the particular age in which we live. We desire to go past because we view it through rose-colored nostalgic spectacles. We desire to go past because we, when we read history, we can see how God delivered people, how God uh, was faithful to his people, and we see how all the problems were worked out where we don't know how God is going to work in our future. We don't know how God is going to work in a faithful way in our life, and so it's much easier to look back at how God has worked than to look forward with hope and faith at how God will work for us. We can look in the past for wisdom for how to live here and now. That's one of the things we're doing right now in reading Solomon's words. We can read about how people thought about life and the world, how to live well. We can then face our issues and struggles with greater wisdom, having learned from the past. But a nostalgic escape, a nostalgic desire for a past time is foolish. There is never any going back. Really, a desire for what is past is a desire for easy answers, a desire for us to know how things will turn out, a desire, and, and as Solomon connects here, a desire to return to an imagined past can easily, easily lead to anger over things that you can't help or can't change. Why am I cursed to live in a time in which people can't even tell me what a boy or a girl is? Why am I cursed to live in a time in which the middle class is shrinking, the economic uh, divide is growing, and the economy seems to be breaking? Why do I live in a time in which there are so many horrible things happening? Why do I have to live in a time in which things are hard? And I think there are two answers that Solomon, and being God's word, God would tell us. The first answer would be what time was not hard for those who lived through it? Right? What hard time was not hard for those who lived through it? Secondly, you live here and you live now because God had determined in his great wisdom that you live here and now. And so what are you going to do as a result? Are you going to shake your hand at him? Are you going to shake your fist at God and tell him he got it wrong and he has treated you unfairly? Rather than desiring this past, this imagined past, our calling is to move into the future with two things, with patience and with humility. Patience and humility. Knowing that God is the author of all history. God is the author of our lives. And so we will wait upon him. The conclusion to Solomon's Proverbs comes in verses 11 through 13. Where again he answers the question that he posed at the end of chapter 6. Who knows what's good for man? Wisdom is good. And wisdom is an advantage for those who live under the sun. He says that the protection of wisdom, literally the, the shade that wisdom provides, is like the protection or the shade that money provides. And again, we talked last week about money. Money and wisdom is not the ultimate savior in the world, but there is an advantage in obtaining it. But once again, they both have their limits. For this last uh, verse in our section, he, he comes back to a question that he asked earlier in the book where he says, can, what, who or what can make straight what God has made crooked? Can we in our wisdom, can we with our money make straight what God in the world has bent and made crooked? No, we cannot. Wisdom and money can help protect, preserve. It can help us live in, a, in, a, in an advantageous way in a crooked world. It can, but it is not the ultimate savior or solution. 
But we know that there is an answer to Solomon's questions of who can make straight what God has made crooked. And the answer to that question is only God can make straight the things that he has made crooked. Specifically, the Son of God who took on human nature in order to begin setting the crooked and bent world straight. And one of the ways in which he set the bent world straight is he became, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he became to us wisdom of God. Christ has come to become for us wisdom of God. This contrary, hard for us to hear wisdom that Solomon gives us is turned up on full display in the teaching and the life and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ teaches us that the way to life is not by avoiding the reality of death, but embracing the reality of death, not only by, by living with a sense that someday we will die, but he tells us that we embrace our death each and every day as we pick up our cross and follow our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us that whoever loses his life for his sake will find it. We can find that we can only have real and true life because it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me as Paul will say in the book of Galatians. We can embrace not only the, the helpful rebukes of a wise friend, but we also know that when we are unjustly rebuked, when we are unjustly reviled, for Christ's sake and for the gospel's sake, Christ says we are blessed. And consider our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the man, one man in all of human history, that never needed any kind of rebuke. But he still humbled himself and he still allowed himself to be reviled for our sake. And so if Christ allowed himself to be reviled by all of mankind as he, as he hung on the cross, then who are we to refuse to accept a needed correction as we seek to follow our Lord? And if we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then what are we ever doing in desiring a past golden age? He tells us the end of the thing is better than the beginning. The end of the world, the end of history, will far surpass the glory that it had at the beginning. All of us, no matter where we are in our life, our best days are ahead of us. And this is why the Apostle Paul could look at the same world that Solomon looked at, the world of vapor, this world that has been bent, this world that is filled with hardships and oppressions and trials, and declare that no matter how hard things are in life, he tells us they are nothing more than a light momentary affliction whose entire job is simply to prepare us for the eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. And so we live not with our eyes and heart fixed on the past, but with our eyes and our heart fixed on the eternal future that we shall live with our, in the presence of our blessed Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would give us a heart of wisdom so that we would number our days, so that we would receive correction, so that we would hope and yearn for the age to come. And Father, we pray that we would do all these things following the wisdom that is found in your beloved Son. In his name we pray.